You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wine, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit hankgarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is. Thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Saman Chanani on the show with me today. He has a brand new book. Today, when we're recording this, is release day. It's called The School for Good and Evil, number six, One True King. And I'm going to tell you, Saman, um, I was was not exactly well-versed in this series until I started reading the new book, which then caused me to go back and start reading the, the whole <laughs> series because I was, I was fascinated and uh, I'm, I'm sorry that I was late to the party, but no, uh, no, of course, but I'm here to the party now. So, um, uh, we begin each show with the same question. And that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? I think when I was a kid, I always felt like I expressed myself better in words on the page than out loud. And I think as I got into sixth and seventh grade, anytime a teacher gave a creative writing assignment, all the other kids would groan and sort of get upset by it. And I remember being quite like relieved somehow, like it was like that it was um, giving me some kind of opportunity that I needed you know, it was what what I was good at. And so I just think that it was always there, you know, and then once I was able, given the chance to express it, I took advantage. Uh, were you a, a bookish kid uh, when, when you were oh, young? Yeah. What were some of the stories that captivated your imagination? I mean, when I was a really young kid, Charlotte's Web, Tuck Everlasting, all the kind of classics that that had a kind of moral amb- ambiguity to things, you know, where there were the villains weren't necessarily you know, so obvious. But I think as I got to be 11, 12, 13, that's when I started departing from kid stuff and and reading because the whole YA world didn't exist. And so, you know, it it just wasn't there. And so I moved on to, I remember that like Michael Crichton was a big one for me because I learned so much about twists and turns from reading those books. And, and um, I think the book that probably had the most influence on me in terms of shaping my kind of consciousness was um, Interview with a Vampire uh, by Anne Rice, because it's very kind of lusty and sexual without it being like overt. And I just thought this idea of creating something very uh, tactile and seductive and luxurious was what I wanted. You know, I wanted it to feel very palpable. And I think that's the style that I carried into the books. And so, you know, this idea of like creating like Harlequin kids books, what came from, you know, just reading a lot of, of Anne Rice, you know, and I think it's what has made the books popular is that it's a tone that is a little provocative and edgy, but kids have never seen before. I, um, I never would have made the Anne Rice connection, the interview with the vampire, but now that you say that I completely get it. You know what I mean? It's, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's just, it's about the, you know, the edges of things and, and heightening emotions and melodrama and, and, all those things, but in a way that also has real stakes. Well, and and the thing that Anne Rice did was was take those things that we've seen a, a million times before and and tell them to us in a new way, in a in a way that that makes us think about it, that makes us feel like we're there without telling us that we're there. It's a it, it it's a really um, she really brought that elevated the the idea of of genre fiction or popular mm-hmm. fiction. Uh, in that way. For absolutely. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I think just also a commitment to a commitment to it, never feeling like what she was telling was silly. Like she, like the idea of an interview with a vampire scene seems ridiculous, but the absolute commitment to it is what made it such a classic. Exactly. Um, did, did you always know that you wanted to be a writer, um, you know, a, a professional writer, uh, or was it, did, did you think that, that you needed to pursue some other goal first? Uh, what, what was your ideas about being a writer? I figured I would 
I never thought it was a possibility. You know, I thought I maybe would go into film, um, but I didn't know how to do that either. So, you know, you just, you, back in those days, you just went and got a normal job and I kept getting fired from them um, and realized that it was time to, to try something else. So that's when I went to film school and sort of the journey began. Um, but no, I had no idea I was going to be, be a writer because I just felt like, uh, it, it didn't seem like a sustainable profession. Right. Did, you know. Right. When, when you went to film school, um, you know, that's that's obviously storytelling, uh, a, a, a different medium from writing. Uh, but, uh, you know, most of us love uh, storytelling in film. Um, did, did you uh, w when you went to school uh, to film school? Did, did it start to scratch that itch or did it just push you even further uh, into the writer camp? Well, I think I became a screen, like I was thinking about screenwriting and directing and I started to learn more about storytelling. And so, you know, I felt like I was going to work in movies. And then only when I had the idea for the school for good and evil and had a few, not necessarily disappointments in film, but just sort of the experience of getting paid for things that, that no one would ever see because so much in, in film is making, you know, writing stuff that never gets made. Um, so it, it felt like it was time to try something different. And I, I took this idea that I had for a movie in the school for good and evil and turn it into a book. So I think, you know, I hit a wall and then, then instead of trying to just beat my head against the wall, I, I changed direction slightly. So what was that first idea uh, for this series? Uh, do, do you remember what the, the kernel of the idea that that first, um, you know, before the world was created, what, what was the first thing that came to you? I think it was the two girls falling into the wrong schools, a princess in pink falling into a school in a, a, like a, a black dungeony school and a girl in black falling into a glass castle. And the idea of these two girls switched, that was the first image I had, you know, and I still remember having it. And I just remember thinking, Ooh, that's interesting. You know what I mean? Right. So the the idea of these these kind of um, uh, established uh, kind of uh, you know fast and, and and furious tropes being kind of turned on their head and and switched up. Um, what do you think it is about taking those kind of common tropes that that are ingrained in in who we are and the the kind of storytelling we've always seen and and mixing those up? Why do you think that? In, that tantalizes us the way it does. I think it's just part of our vocabulary. You know, like I remember when I wrote my I wrote my thesis uh, in college on on female villains in postmodern fairy tales and why wicked women are so compelling to audiences. And I remember it got nominated for this big prize. And so for the prize um, judging, they brought together eighteen professors from all the different disciplines at school. And they parceled them out to the experts. So wh whoever the top three experts on a given thesis were got to read it. So if you're writing one about spinal surgery, then you might have the bio, the chem, and, and you know somebody else read it. And they went through every single one, parceled them all out, got to mine last, and they were like, okay, this one's on Wicked Women and Fairy Tales. And all 18 people raised their hand because all 18 people thought they were experts on fairy tales because we all of us think we're experts on fairy tales. I was like, of course. You know, the funny thing is that the, you know, the most famous fairy tale scholar in the world is Maria Tatar, um, who was at Harvard at the time, and she was there, and she's raising her hand, and she's like, "Why am I competing with like the math guy for this thesis?" She's like, "It's ridiculous." She's like, "You know, like the the idea that everybody thinks they know fairy tales because they watch Disney movies is is absurd." So, you know, I think that that makes it even more compelling material the idea that you that everybody thinks they know it so therefore you better take it on and fix it you know exactly want to grow as a writer and take your writing to the next level give pro writing aid a try pro writing aid is a grammar checker style editor and writing mentor in one package pro writing aid will never replace a human editor rather it helps you self-edit to a deeper level so that when you send it off to an editor they will be able to focus on the meat of your writing and not spend their time fixing basic writing issues. Pro Writing Aid is the only platform that offers world-class grammar and style checking combined with more in-depth reports to help you strengthen your writing. Our unique combination of suggestions, articles, videos, and quizzes makes writing fun and interactive. Writing can be grammatically perfect but still feel awkward and clumsy. 
Pro Writing Aid searches out elements like repetitiveness, vague wording, sentence length variation, over dependence on adverbs, passive voice, over complicated sentence structures, and so much more. Nothing makes a writer lose credibility faster than spelling and grammar mistakes. Submit clean, error free writing. Go to ProWritingAid.com and use code HANK20 for 20% off of Pro Writing Aid Premium. Pro Writing Aid, check it out today. Exactly. So you have this idea. You have this, you know, these, these two characters who are going in, in opposite directions of where we think they're going to go. Um, and then they, uh, th- does this world just open up for you? What, how does the story start to unfold for you then? I think for me it was that I had to learn with the first book. It was the first book I really outlined heavily. And during the writing of it, would get frustrated that things were not following the outline. And I realized that, that I had to let go of the outline at some point because the good stuff happened when I let go of the outline. And that's how I learned to write the books was just to let go and be like, listen, there are elves inside you who know how to do this. They've been doing this for your entire life. Like, stop trying to predict your own story. <clears throat> so I learned not to try to predict my own story and to just go with it. And I think that's what also has made the series successful because I never know what's going to happen. I'm completely as mystified by the twist as everybody else. Um, and I think that honestly has become the series' greatest strength. Okay, so that that brings us, you know, there there are well-defined camps in, in writerdom um, between the pantsers and the plotters. Uh, mm-hmm. And the, the people that are writing by the seat of their pants and the, the, the writer is just as surprised as the readers. And then the, you have the other folks who are planned out ahead of time um, and know where the story is going and, and use a roadmap to write the story that, that they've already brainstormed ahead of time. Mm. Um, so so you are uh, in the pantser camp, is that right? Yes, a hundred percent, hundred percent. So, you know, um, I, I'm just going to play devil's advocate here for a second, um, because I'm somewhere in the middle. I, I like to plot a little bit ahead and write into it and then kind of leave myself open um, for for possibilities. And, uh, you know, try as I might, I cannot plot out an entire book ahead of time. It just doesn't work that way. Uh, for me, but um, you know, let, let's play devil's advocate just a little bit. When you're dealing with a series that's as complex as this one is, with as many characters as you've introduced uh, as you have, um, are you are you literally just writing by the seat of your pants? Do you have any idea where the story is going? I think I always have a beginning, a, a middle milestone, yeah, and an ending. So I have the end. I always know where. I'm going, you know, like, and I think it would be very difficult to do it without that. Sure. Um, I think I have to have a clear sense of the ending, even the last line I need to know. Um, so I think I've had that. And as long as I have the, the, the end goal, then, you know, it doesn't matter what route I take as long as it's clear and, and everything makes sense. Uh, But knowing the ending is the important part. I have to know the end. So you're you're writing toward a known element, but what happens between here and there is up for grabs. Exactly. And I think sometimes you really do end up down a garden path. And the question is, you know, is there a better way to do it? Do you need to come back and unravel things, all that sort of stuff? But uh, I think in the end, for me, it's being able to take those roots and not know where I'm going often yields the best stuff. Absolutely. Um, so you had this idea of, of two princesses being kind of sorted into houses and um, not the places where we anticipate that they'll go. Um, how did the world start building up around that? When, when you first had that idea, what, what did you do with it? Did you, you know, jot that down? Oh, that there may be something to this to, did you start kind of writing these characters to see where they went? Like, how did it begin to unfold for you? Well, for that first book, I really did try to write it as a movie. So I did kind of write it as as a treatment, you know, like a, a, a full-out synopsis. For the latter books, I would just start writing the first chapter and see what happened. But that first book, I really did try to outline, you know, as much as I could. 
Gotcha. So, um, what were you doing while you were writing this book? Were, were you working, um, you know, another job? What, what was what was your life like during this time? I was um, I was tutoring for I was tutoring kids for the SAT and helping them with um, college applications. And so I was doing that basically seven nights a week, and then writing during the day. So, like mentally, I was exhausted all the time. Um, and I felt like I was a floating head for, you know, years and years trying to get these books done and everything like that. And so that was kind of like my, my experience, but I had worked with so many teenagers. I'd met so many kids. I had had so many experiences, you know, kind of intimately with, with kids of the age group I was going to write, write for that. I think it helped me a lot in creating my material. Um, and even having test cases to run material by. So, you know, it sort of went hand in hand, working with these teenagers uh, by night and then writing by day. So you, you, you wrote that first book as if it were a, um, uh, a film treatment. Um, did you know this was going to be a novel? Or when you, when you finished that first story, um, what did you decide to do with it? How, how did it come you know, to the rest of the world and, and become this whole thing that it is now? Well, I'd worked with a producer on um, a couple of movies for Disney Channel. And so I'd gone to her and said, can you read this? It's feeling like a book to me. And she was like, oh, yeah, this definitely feels like a book. She goes, would you be willing to write it, you know, on spec? And I said, you know, basically for no money and, and see if we can sell it. And I said, no, I don't think that's in the cards. I didn't feel like right. Like it just wasn't in me at that time to write a book and to just try writing a book. So, you know, she knew everybody in publishing because she had done she had done a bunch of big adaptations. She had done Tucker Everlasting, Babysitter's Club, um, you know, I can't remember all the other things she did, but she had done all these kind of big classic adaptations. And so she said, well, let me take this treatment out to publishers and see if anyone's interested. And um, I wrote the first couple of chapters of what the, the novel would be. And I think she took it out to 17 publishers. And 16 of them were like, no, we need to see the whole book. And HarperCollins was the one who jumped and bought all three. Like they bought, they bought three books in the series um, just based on that treatment in the first two chapters. So, you know, I think it was luck. It was just, again, luck. Had Harper had that right editor not been there at the right time. And she, yeah, and she was great. She'd been there for a very long time and she loved working with first time writers and she knew kind of, she just could tell in my writing what I was going to do. She liked the kind of subversiveness of it and all of that. And so, yeah, she just left at it. And then that was it. We were off to the races. So it was just, it was luck. You know, I had a release date. I had a movie producer on, I had all these things before I'd ever written a word of it. And so that was its own kind of pressure because I didn't know what I was doing, you know? So I'm writing this book that it's going to have this big launch and, you know, you, you don't, A, you don't want to mess it up and B, you honestly have no clue what you're doing. So, you know, I, I, then I learned to lean into that and basically say, okay, I don't know what I'm doing, but maybe that can be a good thing because maybe I can produce something that is going to feel different than anybody has read before. And I think that is what ended up happening because it became the tone of this is what has made it, I guess, famous in a way because no one had ever quite read that tone before. World Anvil is a browser-based world-building platform designed for all world builders writers and novelists, dungeon masters, game developers, and everyone else. World Anvil keeps your world setting safe and organized, helps you find your characters, locations, plots, timelines, and maps quickly and easily as you write. Then, if you choose, you can showcase your amazing world building to the world, beautifully and interactively, to keep your readers engaged. You can even use our professional tier to build your career selling access to behind-the-scenes content your readers will love and growing your community. Build your world setting in any genre with over 25 custom built world building templates, complete with prompts to inspire your creativity. Allow your readers to explore the public parts of your world in an innovative new way with interactive maps, timelines, and wiki style articles. Give special access to co authors, beta readers, customers, or patrons to see exclusive behind the scenes content. There's a free version to get started with, with all of the major features. 
Guild membership offers you a host of extra options, including comprehensive privacy settings, co-authors, presentation options, and so much more. Join our community of over 800,000 world builders, including professional authors. Take part in competitions and learn more about world building at this fantastic online community. Use the coupon code HANK to get 20% off all 6 and 12 month subscriptions. WorldAnvil.com. I'm a recent convert and I know you will be too. You know, we talk a lot on, on this show about the gift of anonymity and the, the usually um, the first book is written uh, kind of in, in the bliss of writing. Uh, and and sometimes it's not bliss at all. Sometimes it's, it's extremely excruciating uh, hard work. Um, but uh, you, no one is expecting anything. And you write that first book, and then you go through the publishing process, and then that second book usually is where all of the the pressure happens because mm. you know you you have a track record and you, there's something out there that you're competing with your own self with and. And all that, but you didn't get all that. You you were under the wire from the very beginning. That is fascinating. And I think also the sense of, you know, that experience, getting through that. Then I had the opposite experience with two through six because two through six, another writer would have clammed up because they would have had that bliss on the first, and then you know been tight in writing two through six because they would have felt the weight of expectation. I felt the weight of expectation on number one. And so the idea that I could sort of start too fresh and and kind of redo the experience meant that, I don't know, I felt like two through six, I sort of bucked against expectation. Anytime anybody was like, oh, are you sure this is going to be okay? Like, this is such a commercial hit. Do you want to go this far? There were a lot of like, like, you know, like in the second book, Sophie, the main character, I turn her into a, I turn her anatomically into a boy for 60% of the novel. And so... My editor was like, what is happening? She's going to be a boy now? I said, she's going to be a boy now. And so, you know, being able to make that decision and not stress about it was because, I don't know, I just felt like I had earned the right to do what I wanted. And I think that ultimately also helped the series, you know. So, you know, I think just by nature, I guess being a middle child, if you try to impose rules on me, then I just have no interest, you know. I Like, there were so many things we did with – school for good evil that should not have been allowed like you're not allowed to have romance in middle grade books like heavy romance in middle grade books it's just not allowed but i don't know i just was like who made that rule right and so then i changed that <laughs> then like there's a whole thing where the kids turn into animals and when they turn back you know you turn into so if you turn into a bear and you are an eight-year-old boy and you turn into a giant bear your clothes are going to explode right so you come back and you don't have clothes on and everyone was like we can't publish this and i was like why like this is what happens. And they were like, nope, it's obscene. I'm like, it's not obscene. If he lost his clothes, I'll figure out a way to like get clothes again. So then luckily um, this movie Brave came out at the same time from Pixar. And anytime they turned into animals, they turned back and they would have no clothes. And I was like, there you go. So like that somehow got <laughs> me through you, that. Pixar. Yeah. yeah, it got me through that. So it was a lot of fighting the the fight of, you know, I'm going to do what I want. I know you. I know that I'm new to publishing and I don't know the rules and I haven't read any middle grade because I hadn't, you know, I just wasn't interested. I felt like, but let that be the asset, you know? And I think now you've just seen a lot of, of, you know, kind of books crop up in this space that try to follow, you know, that kind of pathway, trying to, to appeal to kids who, um, you know, want something a little edgier from their reading. I love that you were not well versed in middle grade and and couldn't quote all of the um you know the series that were out and you know this is going to be this meets this or you know whatever um um I write a lot of science fiction and when I'm writing I can't read in the same genre a lot of times because it just I don't know it it just feels weird and yeah um, absolutely yeah. you know can can you talk a little bit about writing a genre I think for me, the entire part of writing, you know, middle grade is not to think of it as middle grade. I think of it as I'm writing for everybody. And so, you know, when I'm working on these particular stories, I'm always trying to make them as universal as possible. So 
you know, the fact that I hadn't read any middle grade, I think helped because I've read middle grade since. And whenever I read middle grade, I'm like, wow, I get away with so much. And that makes me nervous. And then I don't, then like in, the inst- instinct is to pull back. And so I just feel like I like not reading middle grade because then I have a very skewed perception of what it is and I'm able to just go for it. And I'm lucky to have a great editor who, you know, has been editing for 45 years named um, Tony Marquis, who edited Maurice Sendak and Shel Silverstein and all these great, these sort of classics. And, you know, she, we, do we fight like every 10 minutes about the fact that she thinks I've crossed the line? Yes. Does she ultimately listen to me and we have a productive dialogue and 90% of the time, does it end up staying? Yes. But the 10% of the time where I do go over the line and it's too far, she is, she's right, you know? And so it's, it's great to have somebody that, you know, in the end of the day is going to do what's right for the book. I'd like, I'll give you an example. It's kind of spoilery, but it's worth saying like at the end of the book, at the end of the fifth book, there's this ring that's super important. And um, Tedros, the son of King Arthur, who's kind of this clumsy, kind of clumsy hunk, you know, um, who is kind of like suave at, at, at one point, but also like over emotional and difficult on the other, um, you know, has this ring and he, he sort of unlocked it with his mouth because um, it's in this locket that you can only open with his mouth. And I needed him to give it to his girlfriend, uh, you know, at the end of the book, because it's such a shock that he finds it. And I have him give it to her by kissing her. And so he literally, like, in kissing her, kind of gives it to her in, in her mouth. And I remember my editor being like, you have just written a 630-page book that ends with mouth hockey. Why can't he just hand her the ring? And I said, because it's better this way. She goes, I think it's reading as just, like, the grossest thing in the world. But she didn't say, like, don't do it. She just said, this is what it's feeling like. And so I went back and was like, well, okay, you have this suave boy who's super clumsy. So it, it was just the tone. It was just tweaking a few words here and there so that it was an idea he had and he sort of did it in the moment. And she was sort of, you make her kind of shocked by it, but then also like, you know, at one point, she, at, like in an instant, the girl is both horrified that something's being passed to her in her mouth and yet also elated that she's having the discovery that he just had. And finally, when I worked on like the 50th draft of this three line little paragraph, she was like, oh, okay. She was, I smiled for the first time. I said, okay, we can publish it now. It's, it's ready. So, you know, sometimes you have to, you have to, you know, stick by your instincts and have the right editor by you to kind of keep asking, why are you doing this? What do you want from this? You know? Absolutely. And it's, it's never a bad thing to, uh, as a writer to keep checking your, your motivations and, you know, am I staying true to what I've created and, Mm. and to my audience? Um, that, that's, that's a good thing that having Mm. those people in in your life and in, in your, your business are, are good. Um, so the, the, this is book six, one true King, uh, that is out today. Um, give people just a little kind of from the 40,000 feet, uh, view of the series and, and the, this world that you've created. What, when, if people are going to go you know, start at the beginning and, and go through this whole series, what can they expect? I think it's it, the way I sort of put it is it, it starts kind of Harry Potterish and ends Game of Thrones where you're, you're in this kind of school where, you know, these kids are trying to, to discover what side of the coin they fall on. Are they good or are they evil? What does their soul represent, you know? And, and are they meant to kind of play the role of leader uh, in life or sidekick or henchman or, you know, like, you know, it's it's a school to sort of evaluate the quality of your soul. And then from there, after the first three books, you graduate into the woods and your different kingdoms. And then, you know, instead of having a happily ever after, we, we get to analyze what that means. What happens when, you know, a girl is engaged to a prince? What does that look like? What's going to happen to them? You know, so, you know, we get to go to Camelot and, and sort of experience it through the lens of Arthurian legend. And you have both like the fairy tale experience in books one through three and then Arthurian legend in four through six. So you're getting a really full kind of look into the world of fairy tales. Speaking of um, Harry Potter, um, have you had this experience that, uh, that JK Rowling had uh, where, you know, you've been writing this for seven years. Um, Do you have, 
readers uh, who have told you, you know, that they, they got on board with book one and have grown with you through the writing of the series? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's been the whole series. We have, Our readership ranges from eight to like 30 by now because of the fact that these kids have grown up with it for the last 10 years. And then, you know, the other interesting thing about it is as they get older, they become artists in their own right and possessive. And she dealt with this too, where it no longer becomes your world, right? I have, you know, there's a petition online somewhere on Instagram to have um, this, you know, some group of kids uh, rewrite the entire series because they know how it should go. So, you know, you, you, you come to appreciate that they care about it so much that it's become their fantasy playground, their world in which they, they experiment and experience, you know? And I never feel like at all possessive of it. You know, anytime a kid comes to me and is like, can I put on a musical of your book at my school? Do I need royalties or copyright? I'm like, no, go do whatever you want. Like, you know, can I public, can I make music? Can I do a soundtrack? I'm like, do whatever you want. You know, this is, this is your world to go play in, you know, because I know what I created. I know what it is, but it's up to, to everybody else to make it their own. Love it. The new book, um, is uh, book six in the series, and it is called The School for Good and Evil, number six, One True King. Um, Saman, w- now that you've finished this series, what what's next for you? I'm not sure. I think I want to do something that's more for, you know, just low expectations just for me for a while um, and see what that's going to look like. So I'm not sure. I think I'm, I'm still trying to get my brain around what it should look like if I do something different and a one-off before I go back and, and do another big series, you know? So I'll do another big series at some point, but I think for right now, I wanted to, to stick to it, to something smaller just for myself. Well, I'm excited to see what you come up with. Um, I, I can only imagine you needing to let your brain air out for a little bit <laughs> and go to a different place. Um, Saman, if if people are just learning about you and and this series and and want to dig into all the great stuff that you do, I know that you are very active on YouTube and uh, and and on social media. Where can people connect with you? They can go to somantianani.net or they can go to somanci on Instagram. It is a great place to kind of find everything. Somantianani on Twitter, and then also. Um, what was I going to say? I feel like those are the best places. Ever, uh, YouTube, Ever Never TV, Summit C on Instagram, Summit Chainani on Twitter, and my website is summitchainani.net. Excellent. We will link up all of those places and um, uh, the, the new book in the uh, show notes of this episode. And uh, we'll definitely send everyone to see you. Uh, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Thanks again. I appreciate it. <laughs>